Stuart Haas Racing could be downsizing to a two-car team in 2025, and the CW will start broadcasting NASCAR Xfinity Series races in 2024. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into those really quickly. We're first going to take a look at a couple of paint schemes that have been revealed over the course of the last four or five days. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Sammy Smith's 2024 TMC throwback scheme that we're going to see at Darlington. Not much change from the original TMC schemes. It's a little different for sure. I do think it looks pretty good, though, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack later this May at Darlington Raceway. And the only other paint scheme we're taking a look at is Fab Moffat's 2024 Petty Throwback Scheme that we're going to see at Darlington. This is a throwback to the silver scheme that I think Bobby Hamilton ran back in 1996. And it also had Eric Gieseps to reveal that as well, by the way. I think it looks pretty solid. I think it does look pretty good. I like the silver. I think it did a pretty good job on it. I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Darlington in May. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Truck Series race at Richmond. As they have a title sponsor for the event, it's going to be called the Clean Harbors 250. Clean Harbors had association with the Truck Series for a very, very long time. They sponsored the Pocono race in the past, and I believe this is the first time that Richmond will be sponsored by Clean Harbors. Really good to see the Clean Harbors will sponsor the Truck Series event. A pretty awesome, a good sponsorship for the event later this year. Pretty awesome stuff overall. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about McKenna Haas. As it was announced on Saturday morning, the McKenna Haas will be sponsored by Interstate Batteries starting here in the upcoming few races. I believe they're going to sponsor for 9 to 11 sprint car races this year in 2024. McKenna Haas has been a driving coach and also a sprint car racer who is 26 years old, who's been grinding her way up for many, many years to try to make it big in motorsports. And now she's going to have a big sponsor of Interstate Batteries. Batteries, obviously Interstate Batteries has had a big affiliation with Joe Gibbs Racing for many years. I think it's really phenomenal to see, and congratulations to McGenna Haas on picking up sponsorship for Interstate Batteries. It's a pretty awesome and cool partnership for her overall. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Hendrick Motorsports. Now, yesterday before the Cup Series race took place, Hendrick Motorsports able to score another major accomplishment. And that was with Kyle Larson winning his third consecutive pole and also Hendrick Motorsports 250th pole in the NASCAR Cup Series. Hedger Motorsports have been hitting milestone records. They got their 300th win last year. They, of course, won the Daytona 500 in their 40th season. They won in their 40th anniversary race in Martinsville, and now they're winning and getting a 250th pole, and they won earlier today as well in the Cup Series race. It's a pretty incredible accomplishment, and I think it's really awesome to see Hendrick Motorsports continues to put on some really good accomplishments. Congratulations to them on getting their 250th pole. I'm telling you, they're going to win a lot of races, and they're going to win a lot more poles going forward, especially most likely with Kyle Larson, who's been a qualifying merchant so far in 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Andy's Frozen Custard. As it was announced earlier today, the Andy's Frozen Custard will sponsor the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Texas for multiple years. It's unclear how many years Andy's Frozen Custard is going to continue sponsoring the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Texas. I think they sponsored about a year or two ago, and I think it probably will at least be a two to three year extension with Texas Motor Speedway. I think that they are from Texas. That's a pretty big reason why they're going to continue working with him. I've had Andy's Frozen Custard in the past. I think it's really, really good. They've also got a pretty big partnership with Stuart Haas Racing this year. Pretty cool nonetheless, though, to see that Andy's Frozen Custard will continue sponsoring the Xfinity Series race at Texas Motor Speedway for at least the next few years. i got to say it's probably going to be at least for the next two to three seasons. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Hooters. Now, with Chase Elliott winning the NASCAR Cup Series race earlier today, he was able to end a curse that's been held for over three decades. The last time Hooters has won a NASCAR Cup Series race before today was June 4th in 1992 when Alan Kowicki was able to pick up the victory. Chase Elliott, with him scoring a victory with the Hooters sponsorship, he finally was able to get that Hooters curse broken. Hooters been a, had a big affiliation with the Elliott family and also had a big affiliation with NASCAR for many years. And we saw Chase Elliott do the quickly pull victory lap after it happened. 
I think it's pretty amazing to see this. And it's just awesome that we finally get to see Hooters go to Victory Lane. I've been wanting them to win for such a long time. And to see them finally go to Victory Lane, I think is awesome and great for the sport. So congratulations to them on finally picking up a win. It's a big deal for the sponsorship. And to see them finally go to Victory Lane, I think is really awesome stuff overall. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Keelan Harvick. Now, last night, Keelan Harvick competed in the Legends race and also the Street Stock race, made his debut in Street Stocks, but also competed in the Legends race as well at All-American Speedway when the Cars Tour was racing there as well. And Keelan Harvick was able to come off the corner in a really great battle and was able to pick up the win in the Legends cars. I don't know if that's his first Legends car win, if I'm not mistaken, but if it is his first win, congratulations him. Keelan Harvick is obviously destined to go NASCAR racing or motorsports racing in the future. I do think in the not-so-distant future, he is going to make his NASCAR debut in the next three or four years, considering that Keelan, I think, turns 12 this year and is only about four or five years away from being eligible to race in the NASCAR a truck series, at least part-time, because once you turn 16 years old, you can run part-time in the truck series. Congratulations to him on getting that accomplishment. I think it's a really awesome, great deal, and to see Killen Harvard going out there and winning races is really awesome stuff. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Joe White. As it was reported by Bob Pockers for the Truck Series race happened that Daniel Dye has a new spotter. So far this year up until this weekend, he had been spotted by Kevin Hamlin. But because of some really bad radio communication that took place at Martinsville Speedway, Joe White who has been spotting for Josh Williams at points this season. He's going to be spotting for Daniel Dye going forward, not just in a select Xfinity Series starts he's going to run later this year, but also be spotting for him in the Truck Series throughout the rest of the year. And honestly, Daniel Dye with Joe White, say what you want to say, they had a really good performance together, and we saw Joe White get Daniel Dye up into a potential top five finish this week at Texas Motor Speedway. Congratulations, him on a good run. It's a shame what happened that caused the spotter change, but I think it's pretty awesome and nonetheless cool to see that Daniel Dye, at least with Joe White, they're able to run really, really good. It's kind of unfortunate what kind of happened to cause that, to be honest, but nonetheless, it's unfortunate to see that kind of stuff happen where you have to make a spotter change because some bad radio communication that took place on the radio. I was not shocked and surprised to see that the radio communication caused the spotter change, but at least someone who's a veteran spotter did a really good job spotting for Daniel Dye. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about John Dole. As it was announced on Friday morning that John Dole has joined NASCAR as Senior VP of Content to oversee and manage the new NASCAR Studios operation. For those who do not know who John Dole is, he had worked at ESPN for many years. He had been the executive producer of The Last Dance, which, by the way, a lot of people from The Last Dance produced. The Netflix documentary The NASCAR presented and also presented a lot of 3430s, which is a big thing that ESPN has had for many years. John Dahl coming in to work in NASCAR, if they give him the reins to manage the NASCAR Studios operation, like I think they're probably going to give him, I do think that John Dahl is going to do a very good job because of how good he is, what he's been able to produce. The Last Dance, one of the biggest documentaries we've ever seen, and I think having John Dahl be able to go do it, I think is pretty incredible. So I'm really looking forward to see what John Dahl has in store and up his sleeve. I'm really happy for him, and congratulations. He's going to get the chance and opportunity to be the executive producer and work and oversee the NASCAR Studios operation. I think it's a pretty great thing to see for sure. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about B.J. McLeod. As it was reported by Arca Sartan Park commentator Colby Evans and also reported on Dirty Mo Media as well, that B.J. McLeod has confirmed that he is going to run the Brickyard 400. B.J. McLeod and Lift Fast Motorsports have made two starts, I believe, so far in 2024. They ran at Daytona, unfortunately did not make the Daytona 500, sadly, and they ran Atlanta Motor Speedway where they show some decent pace and speed. B.J. McLeod has confirmed the reason they're running it is because the purse money is a lot higher. Because of the fact that Live Fast Motorsports is no longer a charter team, because remember they sold their charter off to Live Fast, not Live Fast Motorsports, sold their charter off to Spire Motorsports and Trackhouse Racing as well. They're only running part-time this year, and they're not running the full Xfinity Series schedule as well, though they are expecting to make some more Xfinity Series starts here in the not-so-distant future. 
I think it is unfortunate to see they're not run the full season, but I am glad to see that Bijan McLeod is at least going to run the Brickyard 400 because the Brickyard 400 is going to bring a lot of money. And I do think you're going to see a lot more teams, and I do think there are going to be people that are going to be going home at the Brickyard 400 this year that are going to miss the race, which, of course, is the last race before we get to the break for the next few weeks because of the Olympics. I'm excited to see BJ McLeod running the Brickyard 400 once again. Hopefully they can be able to make the show and do a really good job in the event and can have a good performance. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Joey Logano. As it was announced on the Fox broadcast, that Joey Logano is going to be the play-by-play announcer for the Drivers Only broadcast at Charlotte Motor Speedway. For the last few years since they started doing the Drivers Only broadcast, Kevin Harvick, of course, has been the lead commentator and lead broadcast play-by-play announcer. But because Kevin Harvick, of course, is now part of the Fox broadcast booth this year, they had to give it to a new driver. And that, of course, is Joey Logano. Joey Logano, in my opinion, has been one of the best additions that we've seen on the Xfinity Series and Truck Series broadcast for a very, very long time. And Joey Logano is eventually destined, once he does retire from NASCAR, which probably isn't going to happen for a long time, but once he does retire from NASCAR, he's going to be destined to be going into a broadcast role. I think it's really going to be fun to see him lead Nick's Finney Series broadcast. I don't think the rest of the broadcast group has been announced for that. I hope Ross Chastain is part of that, though, because I think Ross Chastain, his first appearance, I think he did a pretty good job yesterday, and I think he's done a really good job broadcasting with PRN in the past as well. So I'm really happy for him, and I think Joey Logano is going to do a really good job because I think Joey Logano is one of the best people they have. So nonetheless, really looking for it and glad to see that Joey Logano is going to be doing the play-by-play for the Drivers Only broadcast in 2024 once we get to Charlotte next month. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Jeffrey Earnhardt. As it was announced on Friday that Jeffrey Earnhardt will be joining NBA Motorsports in the truck series at Charlotte Motor Speedway. The number, the car colors, and everything else is still kind of unclear at this point, but I believe a K9 charity group is going to be working to sponsor them at Charlotte Motor Speedway. This will be Jeffrey Hart's first start in the truck series, I believe, since 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And this, I believe, will be the first time the NBA Motorsports has competed in the truck series since 2013 or 2014. Jeff Earnhardt has been pacing rides all together this year. Of course, he's made a few select starts with Sam Hunt Racing. He'll making a few more starts later in the year with that team with Forever Long as a sponsorship. Because last year, he did run the full season for the most part with Alpha Prime Racing. But unfortunately, did struggle for the most part last season. And obviously, Jeffrey wants to perform and do a really good job with this team at MBM. Because it's really fun to see that MBM is back in the truck series. It's been a long time since they raced there. They weren't absolutely great over there. But I do think that having them back in trucks, it's really good to see them come back to the series in 2024. I'm looking forward to seeing them back. I think that having them in the series once again is pretty cool. And I think Jeffrey will give them at least a decent and solid performance. I'm looking for a good run. And hopefully they can have a solid enough and good enough run when they go, go to Charlotte. Though they're probably going to be a lot of people enter because a lot of the prize money for the truck series and Xfinity series races are generally up because it's a home race. So I do believe there's a chance of possibility that they'll be able to have a good run. We'll see how they end up doing at Charlotte Motor Speedway in the truck series event. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Andretti Global. Now, on I believe it was Wednesday, we talked about the fact that Andretti Global has opened up their base in Silverstone, England, as they're still trying to pursue a way to get into Formula One. Despite the fact that the FOM, which is Liberty Media, by the way, they have denied them going in. Well, according to a Motorsports.com article on Wednesday, Andretti is actually planning to enter Formula 2 and Formula 3 in order to create a talent ladder to help feed its F1 team with American drivers. And you're telling me that they basically were going to deny them from coming and saying they're not going to bring any value to Formula 1. Meanwhile, you've got Williams, who has been completely struggling. Andretti is really trying to push their way into Formula 1. And if they continue making moves like this, where they are bringing American drivers in and having an American pipeline like this, I do truly believe that F1 and FOM are not going to have a choice but to bring them in. Keep in mind, it wasn't the FIA who denied them. In fact, the FIA actually granted them approval and granted them access to go into Formula 1. It was unfortunately Liberty Media and Stefano Domenkelly who sadly denied them the chance and opportunity to get in because they didn't think they were going to bring any sort of value 
to Formula One, which made no sense to me because if you don't have enough grid slots in the garages, you build tracks that weren't bent for that. And by the way, some of the World Endurance Championship races, you've got way more grid spots than you realize in enough garages to bring those guys in, which are bigger cars, by the way, than the Formula One cars. I think Andretti absolutely needs to be in Formula One. They're going to bring a lot of value. And if you want to talk about competitiveness, Red Bull has won pretty much every single race except two in the last few years. I mean, the only driver that's won outside of the Red Bull camp has been Carlos Sainz in the last year and a half. It's not like there, anyone else is competing against him for the most part, though Ferrari has been able to show a little bit of light and a little bit of speed as of recently. I just feel a little bit frustrated that they're not getting in because they're actually bringing some value, unlike certain teams and certain organizations who are not bringing value to Formula One, looking at you, Visa Cash App, Rebels, and Williams at the moment. I think they need to be allowed in. It is good to see that they at least are working on that facility, and it's good to see that they're going to try to bring a Formula Two program over to the table. And now we're going ahead, Jabon, to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Fernando Alonso. As it was announced on Friday, that for, or Thursday, I should say, that Fernando Alonso has signed a multi-year contract extension with Aston Martin. This will keep Fernando Alonso at least with Aston Martin through the 2026 season. Now, this is pretty significant because there's been a lot of rumblings and a lot of rumors that Fernando Alonso had been potentially considering to go over maybe to Red Bull or maybe even a team like Mercedes, and he had been kind of toying with the media and playing with the media around that. But he's going to stick around with Aston Martin. Now, why is he sticking around? Well, one, I think he knows that there's a new manufacturer coming in. Remember, starting in 2026, Honda is going to be working with Aston Martin to try to build that program back up. Now, Aston Martin has worked with Honda, I believe, in the past, if I'm not mistaken, and they did struggle. Because remember, Honda's leaving Red Bull at the end of 2025 because, of course, Ford is going to be working, but they're going to have their own custom works with Ford starting in 2026. Fernando will be one of the oldest Formula 1 drivers to be on the grid. He'll be almost as old as like when Graham Hill was going out there and winning. But I think he does believe that he can still go out there and compete. And why would you give up when you've been better the last couple years? Because since he joined Aston Martin the last two years, I think he's actually progressively gotten a lot better on the racetrack and he still has got it even at the old age of 41 or 42 years old which again is a lot older for a Formula 1 driver. I think this is the right decision overall for him and I'm very happy and glad to see that he's going to be staying with Aston Martin for the 2025 and 2026 seasons because he's going to be there through 2026. I'm happy for him and nonetheless glad to see that he'll be staying with Aston Martin at least for the next two seasons. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the 2025 Formula One schedule. As Formula One has already announced the 2025 schedule very, very early with them coming up, I believe, their 75th or 76th year. So the season's going to kick off in Australia on March 16th. Then they'll go to China on March 23rd. Then they're racing at Japan on April 6th. Then they'll go to Bahrain on April the 13th. Then they're going to race to Saudi Arabia on April 20th. Then they'll head to Miami on May the 4th. After that, they're going to race in Amol on May 18th. Then they're going to race at Monaco on May 25th. After that, they're going to race to Spain on June the 1st. And then they'll race at Canada on June the 15th. Then they're going to race at Austria on June 29th. And they'll race in the UK at Silverstone on July the 6th. Then they're going to race to Spa on July 27th after a couple week break. And then they'll race to Hungary on August 3rd before they go to their summer break. And then go to Zandvoort on August 31st. After that, they'll head to Monza on September the 7th, and they'll head to Baku on September 21st. Then they'll race to Singapore on October 5th, followed by Austin for the U.S. Grand Prix on October 19th. After that, they'll race in Mexico on October 26th, then they'll race to Sao Paulo for the Brazilian GP on November 9th. After that, they'll race to Las Vegas on my brother's birthday, November 22nd. Then they'll race to Qatar on November 30th, and the final race will be at Abu Dhabi on December 7th. It's going to be the same length of schedule as it was in 2024. The big significant change is, is the fact that Japan moves a little bit earlier in the year. Same with China. Of course, China will have their Chinese Grand Prix on Sunday morning at 2 in the morning Central Standard Time. They'll be the third race because Bahrain and Saudi Arabia because of Ramadan. They're moving the races back a little bit farther in the year. And obviously, Australia is the opening race once again for the first time, I think, in about five or six years because the last few years has been happening in Jeddah and also in Qatar. So now Australia once again open up the season. Overall, I do think it is a decent schedule for 2025. At least there's some change coming. At least that's a positive for sure. 
I don't think it's absolutely an amazing schedule by any stretch of imagination, but having Australia open up the schedule kind of feels a little more realistic to me. I think it is the right decision to have it open up the schedule once again. And I do, like I said, think that the F1 schedule is looking good. And they're the second major motorsports series to also reveal their schedule because you have to remember the fact that we saw IMSA already reveal their schedule like two or three weeks ago, and now you've got F1 releasing their schedule. The big question is going to be who will be the next one. Will the NHRA release their schedule? Will IndyCar release it? Or will NASCAR release it? Because we know that NASCAR is going to try to release their schedule a little bit earlier this season. I'm happy that they released the schedule earlier, though, because now people that are Formula One fans can now plan toward 2025 and plan out the races that they are likely going to go and head out to. And now we're going ahead to on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ross Chessine and William Byron. Now, on the last lap of the NASCAR Cup Series race, you had Ross Chessine in second position and William Byron on third. Coming off the corner in turn number two, Ross Chessine got very, very tight and lost a lot of his momentum because if you get way too high up on the racetrack, you lose a lot of the momentum and the speed you had. Well, William Byron, it looked like to me, had a little bit nowhere to go and just completely runs into the back of Ross Chastain, spinning him out. Now, Ross Chastain came out of the medical center after the race trying to speak to people, and basically Ross Chastain confirmed that he declined to comment about the situation and the wreck. William Byron then spoke to the media after the race, and he said that he didn't want to run into Ross Chastain because he says he and Byron, Chastain and Byron have raced together very, very well, and they race against each other very, very respectively. But Byron feels like it was the last lap of the race, and he was trying to be also a little bit aggressive as well. To me, when I look at the situation, William Byron has never really been or dirty driver in the situation. And I've seen a lot of people that are going after William Byron, calling him a dirty driver, and said he intentionally ran and wrecked into Ross Chastain. That's not the case whatsoever, in my opinion. Now, did he get into and wreck Ross Chastain? 100% no doubt he did get into Ross. But I don't think it was intentional by any stretch of imagination. I just think that Rob William Byron, really kind of like how the Fox broadcast stated, I don't think William Byron really had any time to get below. He could have maybe waited, gone a little bit earlier, but he was coming so fast and Ross had lost so much momentum in that situation that I do truly believe that William Byron in that situation really had nowhere to go. And I think regardless, he was going to end up in the wreck. I really hope they talk after because I know that there's going to be a lot of people bringing conspiracy theories saying that William Byron intentionally wrecked Ross Chastain to try to basically give an easy win over to, to Chase Elliott, which they weren't going to catch Chase anyways. Yes, there was a chance that maybe Chase Elliott had he had an issue on the last up, then maybe something could have happened, but there really wasn't any way they were going to catch him, even if Chase, for instance, ran out of the gas because they were talking about fuel issues. To me, when I look at the situation, I'm not really going to blame Chastain for it. I put a little blame on William Byron because maybe he could have braked a little bit sooner. But to me, I'm not putting full blame on anybody there. I think it was just a racing incident, sadly. Yes, he got into him, but I don't think it was intentional. I think it was just a simple and pretty bad mistake on his end. Disappointing mistake for sure, but I'm not going to be mad at Byron for that because I don't really feel like Byron did anything. Well, he did something wrong and got in him, but I don't think it was intentional in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Shane Van Gisbergen. As Shane Van Gisbergen is going to make his second Cup Street start of the 2024 season this weekend at Talladega Super Speedway, driving the 16 car for Call of Racing. This is now going to be the second weekend in 2024 that he's done double duty. And, of course, he did run his first cup race earlier this year at Circuit Americas. He actually qualified around 11th or 12th position and was running really good at Circuit Americas, but unfortunately lost, I think, power steering, if I'm not mistaken, and was still able to finish inside the top 20, I believe, in 18th or 19th position. Moved up a spot because I think Justin Haley had a disqualification at the event. Ultimately, he's going to probably be at least an underdog to win the Xfinity Series race. I don't think he's going to win, but we know how strong the call of racing cars at least are in the Xfinity Series, and I think that he'll be a pretty big threat to go out there maybe for a top five or maybe a top ten. But in the Cup Series, realistically, he's just out there to get more experience on super speedways. But like I said, to his credit, he did finish in third place in the Xfinity Series, one of his two top fives he's had so far in the Xfinity Series up to this point. I think Shane Van Gisbergen has been doing a very solid job up to this point. The big question is going to be, what is the sponsor going to be? Because we do know the WeatherTech is going to sponsor him for a lot of Xfinity races and for a few more Cup races, to my understanding. But the big question will be, what will be the other sponsor? Will it be Red Bull, perhaps? 
or is it going to be Wendy's? We know for a fact that Wendy's is supposed to sponsor Shane Van Gisbergen in a race this season. And I think it could be Talladega, but I'm not entirely sure up to this point. It's going to be very interesting there. If you want my prediction for the Cup Series race, though, I don't think he's going to be a serious threat or contender for the win, but I do think he'll have a very solid and good performance. I think he's going to contend maybe for a finish inside the top 20 in the Cup race. I think for the Xfinity Series race, I think we'll have a good opportunity to get a top 10. We'll see how he ends up doing, and we'll see how he ends up performing. Nonetheless, so I'm looking forward to seeing him have the chance and opportunity to race in the Cup Series once again and do double duty with Colleg Racing and Trackhouse as well. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Texas photo finish. Now, if you watch the NASCAR Xfinity Series race, you saw a fantastic photo finish between Ryan Sieg and Sam Mayer. We've seen a lot of those so far this year. In the Cup Series, we saw one of the closest finishes in NASCAR history, the closest finish for the top three ever in NASCAR history in the series. But I think the Xfinity Series had their version of Atlanta Motor Speedway. Sam Mayer was getting a lot of ground made up in the last few laps, and as they came to the white flag, Sam Mayer and Ryan Seek put on a really awesome and great show coming to the checker flag of the race. And coming to the checker flag, it was .002,000. So it was two one thousandths of a second, which is the second close, closest finish in NASCAR Xfinity Series history. Tied for a second between this one and Terry Labonte, and I believe it was Joe Nemechek in 1999. And then, of course, we saw this finish as well. But the closest, of course, is the finish between Tyler Reddick and Elliott Sadler at the end of that one. But even when you have Dale Jr. showing a lot of support for Ryan Sieg, you know you're very popular. And as much as I'm happy for Sam Mayer to get the win at the race yesterday, I do feel terrible for Ryan Sieg because Ryan Sieg absolutely put on an impressive performance at the end, and I really thought Ryan Sieg had it. But he kept opening up that entry in turn one, and it didn't really make sense why he kept opening up that entry because he basically handed the win to Sam Mayer on a silver platter. But I also am happy at the same time for Sam Mayer to get the win. It's been kind of a struggle and a frustrating season for the driver of the one car, and I know he's looking for some momentum to really turn the corner in the season. So like I said, I'm happy for Sam Mayer to get the win, but I am also at the same time very disappointed for Ryan C because Ryan C has been close to winning some of these races so many times. I think he's going to win at some point this year. They've had some good pace on the mile and a half so far in 2024. And it's just good to see him be up there contending. It's a shame he was not able to go to victory lane, sadly, but I do agree with a lot of people. I think he did a really good job, and I trust me, I think a lot of people earned a lot of respect for Ryan C and I do think a lot of people became fans of Ryan C after that finish. I think it was the best race of the weekend for sure, and I think they put on a really solid and great performance and a pretty great race overall. It was a pretty awesome and exciting event for Xfinity at Texas Motor Speedway. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Jimmy Johnson. Now, yesterday in the media center, Jimmy Johnson was asked questions about how his car felt when he had the spin in practice yesterday. Now, during the Cup Series race earlier today, sadly, Jimmy Johnson did spin out. But to his credit, he was able to get back inside the top 30. I believe he is credited with a 26 or 27th place finish. But Jimmy Johnson basically spoke, and he's one of the many owners that has spoke on the lack of practice. And Jimmy Johnson said it, that there is not enough practice in the Cup Series right now, or in NASCAR in general, where he can really make a factor and can really make the adjustments that Jimmy Johnson really needs. And I think Jimmy Johnson here was begging for more practice, which I 1,100% agree with Jimmy Johnson. We need more practice in the Cup Series. I think 20-minute shakedowns are not enough for the Cup Series, in my opinion. For me, I think we need to have 40 to 45 minute sessions. I don't think we need the group sessions overall. Combine the length of the two sessions into one, so a 40 minute session. Then you don't have the group qualifying sessions. You, maybe if you want to do group qualifying, that's fine. But I personally think we should do single round qualifying where everyone goes out once at a time. And if you want to bring the final top 10 from the final round into a final round shootout, fine. Go ahead and do that for you if you want to have your little TV. But to me, you don't need to make everything a show. I have never been a fan of group qualifying. I mean, they made it a little more con- not confusing this time around for this year with the way they decided the format. But I think that if we're going to start doing group qualifying going forward, if we want to start kind of doing this stuff, we just if we want to do all the sessions, 
I personally think we should just have one 40, 45 minute session because I don't believe you need two to two and a half hours of practice anymore. But more practice you have, the more potential for storylines. And now you've had three big team owners saying we need practice. Dale Jr. has said it. Jimmy Johnson said it. And I've seen other owners like even Denny Hamlin and Brad Kozlowski even advocating at times. So I've seen Denny Hamlin backtrack that a little bit in the last couple of weeks. I personally do believe we need more practice in this next-gen car in, ra- in racing in general. I personally think we need more practice because you get so much practice for IndyCar, especially in testing as well. This needs more practice because I think the racing will be better for sure. And I do believe we need more practice with the next-gen car, especially because I think some of these drivers are getting acclimated. I think we'll do a much better job. So I really hope we do get more practice in the future. Do I think they're going to do that? Probably not at this point. But personally, I do think in the next-gen car, we absolutely need to see more practice, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Larson. While Kyle Larson did not have a fantastic race at Tex Motor Speedway, he had a lot of success somewhere else, and that was in IndyCar. Kyle Larson completed the open-wheel IndyCar test for the Indianapolis 500 in the veteran class. And Kyle Larson, in the opening morning practice session, was able to get up into second position. And yes, it was with a tow time, but he had a 226 mile an hour lap. And like I said, he was able to be second only behind Joseph Newgarden, who obviously won the Indy 500 in 2023. To be in second position, yes, with a tow, the bit to be In second position with 226 miles an hour in only your first time driving the car, at least in the testing. Granted, he's done a little bit of testing at Phoenix, and I think he did some testing at Texas as well, if I'm not mistaken. To be second place with Aaron McLaren, if you're a fan, you've got to be really excited about it. Because remember, Kyle Larson is going to be doing the double. He's going to be running the Indy 500 and the Coke 600 on the same day. A lot of people are starting to believe that Kyle Larson could win the Indy 500 this year in 2024. And I do agree. Well, I'm not saying that he's the favorite to win. I think that if Kyle Larson can win the Indy 500, I think that is absolutely going to take him into that superstar level that people like Caitlin Clark have been able to achieve. Because I think that Kyle Larson has got the best chance we've seen in a very long time of completing it. We haven't seen it in 10 years. Kurt Busch was the last one that was able to have the opportunity to do it. And Kurt Busch finished in sixth in the Indy 500 with Andretti. Unfortunately, he was not able to get the finish that I think he was looking for in the Coke 600 because sadly, he had an engine failure with around 100 laps to go in the event. I truly do believe that Kyle Larson has got the opportunity to do it. He's driving for one of the best organizations. Aaron McLaren is one of the best organizations in any car, and they look to be the strongest team last year with Felix Rosenquist and Alexander Rossi and even Alex Paul was there in Ganassi. But I think a lot of people know that Kyle Larson is is going to be a threat when we get to the Indy 500. Obviously, he has to qualify his way in. His focus, for whatever reason, is still trying to basically race for a million dollars at the All-Star Race, and apparently Tony Kanaan is going to be the backup driver in case Kyle Larson has to go run the All-Star Race. But if I was there, I would focus on making the Indy 500 and focus on getting in the top six and winning the poll for the Indy 500. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But for Kyle Larson, like I said, to finish second in the testing, we, of course, which got rained out, sadly, to be second. If you're a fan of Kyle Larson, I think you got to be looking at him as a serious threat and a serious contender to get it done. I think he's going to be a threat. I think he's going to be a major contender. And I do truly believe that Kyle Larson will have a chance to win the Indy 500. I think he's minimum going to finish in the top 10 in the Indy 500. And I do believe he is going to be a contender. And I think he will win the Coke 600. But for Kyle Larson to be as fast as he was at Indy 500 opening testing, I think is really, really huge, not only for Kyle Larson's confidence, but also for Kyle Larson's career as well as a driver. And I do personally believe how good of a driver he is. I think he'll be a major threat to get it done. I'm not saying he's my pick to win at this point, but if he's good next month in Indianapolis, I do believe that Kyle Larson is going to run good. But you have to keep in mind that a lot of the drivers were using their Long Beach cars. They were not using their Indy 500 cars, and we'll see when those guys use their Indy 500 cars, how Kyle Larson's going to be. But like I said, to be second after day number one of testing and after the first time of testing, I think you got to be really happy and really excited, especially if you are a Kyle Larson fan. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Texas Motor Speedway. Now, obviously, earlier today, 
we ran the NASCAR Cup Series race at Texas Motor Speedway. And obviously this race was very, very chaotic and really crazy. Chase Elliott was able to pick up his first win in nearly over a year. But there were a lot of drivers who were asked questions about Texas Motor Speedway and what you would do with the track in the future. Because there's obviously a lot of talk conversations behind the scenes in the last couple of years that because of the fact they moved Texas to earlier in April, a lot of people do believe that Texas Motor Speedway might get repaved and also potentially reconfigured in the not so distant future. Kyle Busch had some very harsh criticism words for Tax Motor Speedway on Saturday when speaking to media. He criticized Texas base. He said it's very, very slick, very, very loose, but also says that if they do go ahead and repave and reconfigure it, he actually does believe that Tax Motor Speedway is going to eventually become a super speedway like track. Chase Sully, who went on to win the race earlier today, criticized Tex Motor Speedway as well, basically saying that I would rather wait out in weepers and rain delays than race at the track that we are racing at now. Now, obviously, I have my personal opinions on Texas Motor Speedway. And we even saw some issues with Tax Motor Speedway as well this weekend. If you watch the Truck Series race, they took the score pile along out for the first time, and they apparently had scored on Big Haas TV. And apparently there were lighting issues that were happening at Tex Motor Speedway. And Denny Hamlin had a very funny comment in the comment section of Bob Pockers' post, which I thought was really kind of summed up my thoughts about Texas Motor Speedway as well. To me, I am personally not a massive and big fan of Texas Motor Speedway. Do I think the race in this weekend was actually okay? Yeah, I think the Truck Series race was decent. The Xfinity Series race was pretty good in my opinion. The Cup Series race was a complete crap shooting to wreck fest. It's really hard to gauge how good the race or bad the race was. Yes, it was entertaining. I will give you that. But it was kind of unwatchable times because of the wrecking. The problem with Texas Motor Speedway right now is I just think the track itself, it just really does not race good in my opinion. Because if you get above a single groove of the racetrack, especially in turn number one, there's a very good chance because once you get to the second groove of the track, it's kind of like black ice. And if you get in there, there's a really good chance of possibly that you're likely going to wreck your car or your truck and you're going to wreck it in the outside wall and you're going to have a backup car. We saw so many drivers, yes, who were going for the win, but if you get in that second lane and you move up into that second lane, you're going to likely end up wrecking your car or your truck. And I think that that's something they need to do. I think the track got a little better this weekend, and I think a lot of it is because the PJ1 might be finally, after being completely stained for many, many years, it does look to me like it's finally starting to wear off, which I think a lot of people are going to be very happy if that PJ1 goes overall. It needs to go to make the racing better, in my opinion, and I really hope, for the love of God, they make the right and good decision to go ahead and get rid of all that PJ1 on the track and don't add any more, which they haven't had any more recently, which I think is really, really good. But I really hope they make the right decisions here. And personally, I think Texas isn't in a great track. I do think they're going to reconfigure it to what? I don't know at this point. But I personally do believe that there is a reconfiguration that is coming for Texas Motor Speedway in the not so distant future. I think they're going to try to turn to Super Speedway, like Kyle Busch says. I do agree with him to the most part because I think a lot of people are not big fans of Texas Motor Speedway at this moment. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Matt Kenseth. Now, if you were on Twitter on Friday evening, Eric Isep put out a tweet showing an Instagram story from Jimmy Johnson showing that maybe there's a potential possibility that Matt Kenseth may or may not be making a return in the future. Now, obviously, this could just be a teaser and having Matt Kenseth getting behind the wheel basically on the simulator. Now, obviously, Matt Kenseth is working as one of the higher ups at Legacy Motor Club, and there's a lot of people that have been wanting Matt Kenseth to make a return for the last few years. The last time Matt Kenseth raced in the NASCAR Cup Series, always back in 2020, when he drove for Chip Ganassi Racing. And he's not the only driver over the last few years that's been kind of teasing a return. Kurt Busch, we're not sure if he's ever going to come back or not, but Kurt Busch was trying to make a return last year in 2023. Obviously, he confirmed he'd be retiring from full-time racing at the end of 2023 at Daytona in August. Casey Kane's been open to return over the last year or so, completing full-time, of course, in the High Limit Racing Series at the moment and owning that series, not owning series, but owning a team in that series with Brad Sweet. And obviously, he, we've seen drivers like, you know, Carl lever has been teasing return over the last year or so, though Kurt has not been back, not Kurt, Carl Edwards has been trying to make a return, but obviously it hasn't happened at this point. 
Obviously, when you think about Matt Kenseth, one of the most successful and underrated drivers in NASCAR Cup Series history. Nearly 40 wins, won the championship in 2003. And like, even though 2020 did not go well, Matt Kenseth still had a very solid career. And you can even go back to 2018 when he drove from Roush when they were struggling back in 2018 for Brad Kozlowski came in in 2022. He almost won some races in that six car. If I can remember the 2018 break car 400, he was one of the dominant cars Early in that race, if I'm not mistaken, he won a stage and ran up in the top 10 in a majority of that race. And then you think about some of the other years prior, 2017, he won in the 20 car. And Matt Kenseth was one of the best drivers that race in the sport. And now he's working as a brand ambassador. Now, do I think more than likely he's going to make an official return? I think it's possible. I wouldn't be surprised at this point considering that that 84 car is kind of a legacy car with Jimmy Johnson getting behind the wheel. I wouldn't be shocked or surprised to see him get a chance and opportunity. And you think about the possibility that Legacy could get a third charter in the future, though I don't think Matt Kenseth is going to go full-time considering Matt Kenseth now is 52 years old. But I think that Matt Kenseth may make a return to the Cup Series in the future. I certainly think, especially with him teasing a potential possibility, I do think that Jimmy Johnson is teasing a possible return for Matt Kenseth. And I would love to see him come back behind the wheel. Now, do I think he's going to be extremely successful? No, absolutely not, because Matt Kenseth has not raced in an action car ever. I think he's may have had a little bit of experience because he did a good job explaining it back two years ago when he's commentating with Clint Boyer and Mike Joy on Fox. But I don't think Matt Kenseth would be successful, though, because you think about the next-gen car. You've got to be quick and on point. And we've seen Jimmy Johnson has only made a few starts in the next-gen car completely struggle. And I'm worried that Matt Kenseth, who I think would be better than Jimmy, I just don't think that Matt Kenseth would do absolutely great. But I would love to see him come back and make a return, along with drivers like Carl Edwards and Kurt Busch. I would love to see those drivers come back and make a return. Do I, like I said, do I think it's going to really happen? I don't know at this point if it will happen, but I would love for it to happen. So I really hope they can make an arrangement for it to happen this season, just a one-off return, maybe at a super speedway or maybe at a road course, perhaps, even though Matt Kenseth wasn't great at road courses, or maybe go to track like Homestead where Matt Kenseth was pretty good at. That would be, pure, be pretty awesome and pretty fun. We'll see if they make a return. The 84, we know, is coming back from our eight races, with, or seven races, I should say, with Jimmy Johnson later down the road. The next race, I believe, is Dober, if I'm not mistaken, for the 84 car. So we'll see. Maybe they can run a race later, like a Daytona down the road for Matt Kenseth, considering Matt Kenseth was solid there. But I really hope that we do get to see a chance and opportunity for Matt Kenseth to come back, though I'm not entirely sure if it will happen, to be honest with you. And now we're going to head jump onto the first of two major stories in today's episode as we're talking about the CW. Now, I did a video talking about the CW on this channel, but we didn't have the full details on what was going on over at the CW. But it was finally confirmed on Thursday, middle to late afternoon, that the CW, in fact, is going to broadcast the final eight NASCAR Xfinity Series races in 2024. Now, NBC is going to produce these broadcasts, and they will have practice and qualifying all on NBC and USA. But the races are going to be broadcasted on the CW. And Rick Allen, Steve Letarte, and Jeff Burton are going to commentate all of those races. Now, obviously, Rick Allen will not be part of the Cup Series broadcast going forward after the Olympics happen. Lee Diffie, we know, is going to be taking over that, which we'll talk about that here in just a second. So the original trio that covered the Cup Series from 2015 to 2017, because remember, Dale Jr. also not going to be part of the NBC broadcast going forward. The original trio, when they came in, will be there. But there's also another very interesting thing, is there's some new times. So for the final eight races, Bristol is going to be at the original time on 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then Kansas has been moved to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from what I originally believe was 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Charlotte will be 4 p.m. Eastern as well. Same with Talladega, which all be 4 p.m. Eastern. Talladega, of course, before Charlotte. Those are originally three. Talladega will be at four. Then Las Vegas Motor Speedway goes from being an afternoon race and it'll be a night race at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then Homestead Miami Speedway will be at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then Martinsville will also be at 4 p.m. Eastern. And then Phoenix will move an hour later to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is absolutely huge for a lot of reasons. Because remember, there's a few things to note about this. 
Number one, this ordeal was originally supposed to start at the beginning of 2025. But what I believe happened here was that the CW was begging to have some races early to get people prepared for the new change. Because they want to get everybody prepared to head over to CW. Because while it is going to be free on air, some people are not going to be able to adapt to basically being free over the air broadcast, even though it can be very simple to go to. But I like that they're bringing the playoffs for the Xfinity Series over there. And the other big reason why I think this move is happening is because NBC this year has acquired Big Ten coverage, if I'm not mistaken. So they're moving it over there to focus on the Big Ten coverage. Because remember, the Xfinity Series is basically moving away at the end of the year, and they basically are losing that coverage. So it makes a lot of sense. Another big thing that I believe this will confirm is that Xfinity will not be covering and will be the main broadcast, well, the main sponsor, I should say, starting in 2025. Because remember, NBC, Xfinity, and NBC are both under the same umbrella, under the Comcast umbrella. But to see with them going over to CW, I do think Xfinity is going to be completely gone. What does this also mean? Well, I do believe that Bush potentially come in and maybe be the title sponsor. That's going to be something that could be a thing. Maybe they become the Grand National Series once again. Or maybe potentially we see Bush come back in and be the title sponsor. I think that would be absolutely exciting and really fun for sure. But now we also speculate for 2025. Who could be in the broadcast booth for 2025? Because I certainly don't think Rick Allen is going to be a part of that unless he goes over there in 2025. Because Rick could go there, but I think Steve Latar and Jeff Burton could stay with NBC. I think there's a chance they get someone like a Carl Edwards. Carl Edwards did some NBC broadcasting, and I think he's done a really good job as a color commentator in the past as well. And I think he did a really good job during the throwback race last season. And if Carl ever gets back behind a wheel of a cup car, it'd be really cool to see him get the chance and opportunity to call races. Maybe they get someone else like Dale Jarrett to come over to CW. That would be exciting. Maybe they get Alan Best to go over to Lee commentate. Maybe they get like Kurt Busch to come over and do commentary. I think a booth of Carl Edwards, Kurt Busch, and Alan Bestwick would absolutely be good. Because I do think there's a chance that Rick Allen is going to go to Amazon next year with Dale Jr. Because some people do think that that is going to happen. But if they don't get Rick Allen over there, I think Alan Bestwick would be a really good pickup if he doesn't go to Amazon having that trio as your booth. Another big thing you think about is what is going on with NBC. Because NBC is making a lot of weird moves recently. First, Lee Diffie. Is not going to be comment. Well, he's going to be commentating Cup Series races going forward after the Olympic break, after the Brickyard 400. Because you do have to remember that there's a good chance IndyCar is probably going to be leaving NBC, by the way. But I think that Lee Diffie's taking over because IndyCar is probably going over to Fox next season. Then Dale Jr. was announced that he was not going to be returning to NBC. Well, he didn't. He announced didn't announce in itself. It was reported that he was. That he's going to be going to Amazon and Warner starting in 2025. So Dale Jr. is not going to be available. And you think about all the moves that NBC has been making. I think that they're starting to show a lot of lack of interest in NASCAR, especially with Dale Jr. not being there anymore and less money coming in with Amazon and Warner coming in. I think they've lost a little bit of interest in NASCAR, that being NBC. That being said, when I look at this move for the CW, I think this is a great and huge move for them because it's going to be over-the-air broadcasting. You're going to be able to watch it for free on the app. If you've got it, you can watch it. And it's basically one of the biggest channels that you can go and watch. And I think this is not only going to grow the Xfinity series, but I think it's going to really help them grow the product overall. It's going to be very fun to see what happens. But like I said, I am very excited to see that CW is going to be coming in starting in 2024. A little earlier than normal for sure. I think a lot of people were a little surprised about that. But again, I'm very happy to see that the CW is going to be coming in and they're going to be doing it starting in the 2024 season. A little bit earlier than normal, but I think it's exciting to see that they're going to be coming in earlier. And now we're going ahead, jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Stuart Haas racing once again. 
Now, this has been a big story that has been being talked about over the course of the last few weeks because there's a lot of speculation going on at the moment that Stuart Haas Racing is likely going to be selling charters at the end of the 2024 season and downsizing potentially to a two-car program in 2025. Now, Ryan Priest spoke to media about the situation. Of course, Front Stretch and multiple reporters from Front Stretch, I think it was Phil Alway, if I'm not mistaken, had asked Ryan Priest about this, and Ryan Priest confirmed to White Watson and Phil Alway that he really doesn't pay attention to the news as much, and he's just focused on driving the cars. Now, we know that they're potentially going to sell. Let's talk about 2311 Racing for a second, because Denny Hamlin also commented on it as well. He says 2311 Racing is currently satisfied with two cars, and because of the fact that they basically don't have a charter agreement that's finalized yet for 2025, they are not planning to expand. We'll get back to 2311 Racing in just a second, but let's talk about Stuart Haas Racing. They obviously has been a lot of time conversations surrounding them potentially downsizing. Well, why could they be downsizing? Well, the big reason why it looks like they're going to be downsizing in 2025 is because it's very likely at this point that Stuart Haas Racing is going to be losing their Tier 1 support. They Their contract with Ford comes to an end this year, and they have not signed an extension or agreement for 2025. Currently, under their current deal, and under their current contracts, they are required to have four charters and four cars on the racetrack at all times. Because if they don't have four cars on the racetrack at all times, they will break that contract and will lose their deal with four. With Farmer Motorsports coming into play to basically become a Tier 1 organization this upcoming season, it would make only that kind of sense for them to make this move to downsize. And again... I don't think it's just going to be one charter that's going to be going away at the end of this year. I think that they are going to downsize to a two-car program in 2024. So who is going to stay and who is going to go? Well, my prediction right now is that I think for sure that Josh Berry will be staying in the four car this next season. I think Josh Berry's had some solid performances. I know today did not go well for him in that four car and four two crash out. But Josh Berry's had some top 20 performances and has had top 10 speed in some races so far this year. And if Josh Berry goes, you lose Rodney Chillers, who is a big key partner. And we have seen Josh Berry bringing in a little sponsorship and a little funding as well. They've been piecing that sponsorship together. And I do believe that Josh Berry has been doing a very good job with Sewer Haas Racing this season. So I think Josh Berry is going to stay. The other driver, and I think this is going to be a little controversial with some, but Noah Gregson. Look, Noah Gregson, in my opinion, while yes, Chase Briscoe's been good, we'll talk about him here in just a second, Noah Gregson's bringing a little sponsorship, and Tony Stewart likes Noah Gregson quite a bit. And I think Noah Gregson has been doing a pretty good job. He's been better than Eric Amarol was in this 10 car last year, and I do think, like I said, that we have been seeing improvement in performance from Noah Gregson this year. So those are two that I think are going to stay. So that means that Briscoe and Priest are going to be gone according to my predictions. Ryan Priest is a no-brainer. Ryan Priest, I think, is a very talented driver, but he does not bring a lot of sponsorship funding to the table. And for him to keep the seat next year, he's going to need that sponsorship funding to stay in that 41 car. And basically, throughout the whole year, he's been basically being completely funded, for the most part, outside of a few races by United Rentals. He's been, for the most part, being funded basically by Haas Automation, which is Gene's company. And we know that it looks like they're going to sell him for a little cheaper on the charter prices because they can sell him for like $20, $30 million if those prices go down. And I think Gene doesn't want to pay out of pocket as much anymore. So I think Ryan Priest, no doubt, is going to be gone, even though I think Ryan Priest is a good driver. I think Ryan Priest probably will go part-time with a team like Rick or Racing or could go to the Wood Brothers, perhaps. That certainly is a possibility. And then the other one is Chase Briscoe. If I'm not mistaken, Chase Briscoe is under contract with Ford. Morty's under contract with Stuart Haas Racing. So he would not be able to stay with Ford, with SHR, if they were to, for instance, leave in manufacturers, because we do think the SHR is probably going to be leaving Ford at the end of this year as well. So Chase Briscoe is under contract with Ford. And yes, I think he's been the best former S2 or Haas Racing. In fact, I look at his standings before I've recorded this video, and he's actually 12th in the standings right now, which I think is pretty impressive when you really think about it. Got a lot of stage points in the race today. But Chase Briscoe, like I said, is under contract with Ford, and he revealed this not too long ago. That this is a contract year for him. So I do think that Chase Briscoe is going to be gone. Where does Chase Briscoe go? Well, I predict that he's going to the Wood Brothers, and here's why. 
I think the Woodbirds, if Chase Brisk goes to the 21 car, they become a Tier 1 team. Harrison Burton only got his third finish above 30th this season in the first nine races. He is still 34 from the points. He's been struggling for a mass, a vast majority of the season so far. And if I was Woodbirds, if I want to get better, i got to get rid of Harrison Burton. I'm sorry. He's just not been good this year. He has been struggling immensely. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's let go early in the year. So I think Chase Briscoe is going to go to the Woodbirds next season. Now, the big question is, who are going to get the charters? I think there's five or six key teams that are in the running. First one is Trackhouse Racing. They need more charters because they've got four or five drivers under contract and only two rides at the moment. Washington has a long-term deal with Trackhouse. Daniel Suarez currently under contract this year, but I think he's probably going to stay. He just got his first top five since Atlanta, so I think that he'll probably end up seeing with Trackhouse Racing. Do I do need to see a little more improvement from Daniel Suarez going forward? I think he will stay there, though, next season because he got that win in Atlanta. You've got Shane Van Gisbergen. SVG, been doing a really good job in Xfinity, going to make his second cup start this week in Talladega. I think he's going to stick around in 2025. I think he's going to go to Trackhouse full-time in the Cup Series next season in the number 97 car. And I think Zane Smith, the 71 from Spire, will become a full Trackhouse car. Zane had a decent performance at Texas, didn't get the finish I think he deserved, but I think Zane Smith will be moving over full-time in the Trackhouse family. And I think Connor Zilch might get some Cup starts next year, but with another team I'll talk about in just a second. Trackhouse, they're going to be in the running for charters. I think they're going to expand. Then you've got 2311 Racing. I think they're going to expand next year. I know Denny Hamlin's saying they're committed to two cars right now, but when you look at Denny Hamlin, they want to expand next year. They've talked about it. they got to get the charter agreement done and finalized, but I think they want to get a third full-time car. Who could drive it if they go third? Well, you got Chandler Smith and Corey Heim as the main candidates for sure. Maybe you get Kurt Busch and Carl Edwards as a potential possibility. Maybe you get someone else you don't know at this point. But I do think that they are absolutely for sure going to expand, maybe getting one of those SHR Carters. You do have RFK Racing as well. Bragazowski has made it publicly clear that he wants to bring RFK to a third full team. It would make a lot of sense because they are a four team currently at the moment, and I think they want to have a third car. They could get someone like a Haley Deegan, perhaps, if they wanted to. They could get someone, of course, like Matt Benedetto, who's part of the four camp again. You could get someone like... Maybe Cam Waters over here full-time. That certainly is a possibility. Or maybe Mike Rockefeller. But I certainly do think they're looking to expand. You obviously then, of course, have a couple other organizations like Legacy. They could have a third car for maybe Corey Heim. And then Junior Motorsports also gets mentioned as well quite a bit. I think Junior Motorsports could be a sleeper pick to pick up a charter this year. Obviously, I know that they keep teasing about it and stuff. They could get a partnership with SHR, but I don't think that's going to happen. So I do think there's a chance of possibility that they do acquire a charter. But it's, if, if they do get one, I think they, you have to look at drivers like Connor Zilich to make select starts, maybe potentially Carson Quaffle, Bubba Parr. That could be a possibility. Nonetheless, it's going to be interesting. And I think Legacy is the last one that's in the running. I actually mentioned Legacy. I think RCR could be a sleeper as well. I think the charter goes to Trackhouse, though. I think one of them goes to Trackhouse. And maybe the other one goes to 20 through 11 or RFK. So, that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. One thing, guys, for watching, please subscribe to the channel. The notifications on, so if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and support on Patreon as well. Link in the description below that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. Who do you think buys SHR charters? If you, SHR charters, if they downsize, let me your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about all the other things we talk about today's video, including Texas, the great photo finish, and also the CW news. Let me your thoughts in the comments below. Tomorrow on the channel, we're going to have the entry list for the Cup Series race at Talladega. We might have race picks dropping as well. Then Wednesday, we're going to have a NASCAR news video. And if I don't drop race picks for Xfinity on Tuesday, they'll come out on Wednesday. Then on Thursday, I'll have race picks for the Cup Series race. And I'll have some other content dropping, including on Fox as well soon. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode. And I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, buddy.